you very much. Thank you for being with us this morning. It's my pleasure to welcome General Vincent K. Brooks, graduate of the class of 1976 to Jesuit High School this morning. Just a bit of a background. As a student athlete at Jesuit High, General Brooks not only excelled academically, but also played basketball and ran track. He was graduated, as I said, in 1976 and then attended the United States Military Academy at West Point, graduating in 1980. In his senior year, General Brooks was appointed Cadet Brigade Commander. So he was appointed the top ranking cadet at the Corps of Cadets at West Point. He also played varsity basketball in his uh, freshman year, and his coach that year was Mike Krzyzewski, who you may know now as the coach at Duke. In addition to his undergraduate degree from West Point, General Brooks also earned a graduate degree in military art and sciences from the School of, of Advanced Military Studies at Fort Lovewood, Kansas, which is where I grew up, so it's good that you know Eastern Kansas now. General Brooks has served our nation well over his long and distinguished career. His postings have included service not only in the United States, but also in Europe, the Middle East, and in Central Asia. He has been the commanding general of the Third Army, the U.S. Army Chief of Public Affairs, and has served on the Joint Staff as Deputy Director for Political and Military Affairs for the Western Hemisphere and as the Deputy Director for the War on Terrorism. Since July 2013, General Brooks has served as the Commanding General of the U.S. Army Pacific Command, the Army's single largest command. He leads more than 106,000 soldiers in the Asia Pacific Theater, these men and women who are stationed in Japan, Guam, Hawaii, Alaska, as well as in the Western United States. General Brooks's brother, Brigadier General Leo Brooks, retired, is also a graduate of Jesuit High, class of 1975. And General Brooks is joined today by his wife, Dr. Carol Brooks, and welcome to you as well. General, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Jesuit High School's class of 2015 and members of our faculty and staff. So men, I invite you to stand and welcome an exceptionally distinguished graduate of Jesuit High School, General Vincent Brooks. I tell you, I'm so excited that uh, I could come back to Jesuit. Uh, first, let me thank Father Sawalski uh, for giving me this period of time. I know that the academic program here at Jesuit is not one that has a whole lot of slack time in it. And so to take you away from your studies, you're probably pretty excited about that, but I know the faculty's not. So I appreciate it, Father Sawalski. Thanks for letting me do that. And Principal Paul as well. Uh, I didn't see what she just went to. She's in the back. Thank you so much to both of you for the leadership that you're giving to this tremendous institution. The years continue to roll up and become greater and greater in number. The number of graduates of Jesuit High School continue to grow in number, but the impact of Jesuit is what grows even greater, much more exponentially. As we put out more and more men of character out into society in ways that can make a difference. So I'm really excited about uh, having the privilege of coming back. I do want to uh, just talk to you for a few minutes. Johnny, you had that, 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 if you can bring that chair and the jacket, please. A chair and the jacket, please. Uh, I'm gonna take my jacket off if that's okay with you, uh, at least for a few minutes. And uh, I just wanna share some thoughts with you first, but I really want to interact with you. So I want you thinking about what do you wanna ask this guy standing up here that's taking you out of class. What do you really want to know? And I'll tell you, any question is open. I'll be careful about my answer. But your questions are not to be limited. I want to know what's on your mind and I want to interact with you. Now you see me perhaps as an Army Four Star General standing in front of you right now. If I could take my jacket off. And I am. 
an Army Four Star General. There are only 13 of us for the entirety of the uh, United States Army. Excuse me. And so you might feel that that's kind of rare, but I'm a Jesuit high school graduate. That's what you need to really be thinking about. This is simply a reflection of where I am in my current journey as I answer my calling. And there's a calling that awaits each of you. This is something that you know because you go to Jesuit High School. You're part of something extraordinary here, something very, very special, and I, I, I just want to share a few thoughts with you about that. There are a couple of folks that I, I do want to acknowledge inside of the room, a couple that I just ran into a few minutes ago that are blasts from my past. First, uh, John D. Piazza from the Jesuit High class of 74, I guess it was John, and went off to the U.S. Military Academy. John, where, where'd you go? There you are, sitting right over here. Went off to the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. He was the first graduate of Jesuit High School to go to West Point and really had kind of set the tone for what my brother then did as the second graduate of Jesuit to go off to the U.S. Military Academy, myself as the third. So I was following in John's steps. And John, I just want to say it's great to see you again. Been a number of years. Uh, thanks for your service, thanks for your example, and thanks for being here today. Also in the back, my classmate Mike Miller. Uh, Mike was a great friend, a great athlete, multi-sport man, a block G man like myself. And I just ran into Mike as I was walking down uh, down the hallway here, and that's just tremendous, Mike, to see you again. Uh, it's so good to connect with people that you have been a part of. Now, you may not realize that right now. You may not realize the degree of connectedness that you have as the class of 2015. But trust me when I tell you that these are friends for life. And you will find that no matter where you go, and I've, I've been all over the world and been fairly scattered, I've been away for a long time. In fact, this is my first time being back on campus since 1976. But Jesuit has been with me every single day since then. Absolutely, there's no question in my mind that that's, that's the case. I'll tell you a couple stories, and with these stories, I wanna leave a few life lessons. But before I do that, I want you to see me in a different way. I don't want you to see me anymore as an Army Four Star General. I want you to see me in a different way. So let me change clothes. I pulled out from my old archives. Something that might look familiar. I want you to see me this way. I want you to see me as you in 38 years. I want you to see me as you right now, where you are in life, the things you're thinking about, the excitement about coming to the end of the experience of high school, but the uncertainty about what's awaiting you next. The questions about what life will hand to you as opportunities and as challenges in the years to come. The memories that are already beginning to start to well up inside you, things that you remember. But it's winning the Holy Bowl over and over and over again. Well done, well done on that. You gotta keep up the tradition of beating down Christian brothers. Nothing personal about it, but that's the way it should be. I can remember walking through this campus and really seeing it for the first time back in 1974. It was a surprise to me because I had just come from Virginia. I had been in Virginia for the previous seven straight years and actually felt like I was from someplace. Being a military brat, my father was also military. And he came down on military orders to come and command the Sacramento Army Depot. It doesn't exist anymore. It was on the south side of Sacramento. And that's where we lived. i had been in an excellent high school, a public school in Northern Virginia, in the strongest public school system in America at that time. 
And I was coming to Sacramento, which did not have the same reputation academically. But there was one place in Sacramento where the highest standard of education was being offered, a college preparatory program called Jesuit. And my parents were uh, able to look forward far enough and realize that the best investment they could make into my brother's future and my future was to enroll their sons here at Jesuit Prep. And so we began in the summer of 1974 amid all kinds of rumors about our athletic prowess. You know, everyone said my brother could run the, the 40 in about four and a half seconds. And that Vince Brooks could jump so high that he could lead change on the top of the backboard. This wasn't true. I never left change. I never left change. I could get up that high, but I never left change. No, we, uh, we had a reputation coming in here that preceded us. And it was a high reputation to live up to. We just wanted to be members of the student body in Jesuit High School. Diversity was not as great then as it is now. I can look through the audience and see a great diversity. I know that Jesuit has worked hard to make sure that this is a diverse student body because that's part of the strength of who we are as a nation. It's certainly part of the strength of who we are as an institution, as a high school. But then we came to begin to experience the Ignatian tradition of education. Getting exposed to the Jesuit order, which I found a little bit strange first. Their focus on discipline, their focus on character, their focus on service to others as individuals, service to others within a community. It was different than what I saw on the East Coast. The culture of California was entirely different. I learned a whole different set of words and languages that I hadn't heard before. Cruising meant something about riding a very loud vehicle downtown. Bitching had nothing to do with complaining. It was about something really good. I hadn't heard that term before coming to California. I don't know if we still use that term anymore, but we talked about it as a bitching car down there cruising. It's like, you what? So I had to learn a different language to come here, but immediately I felt that I was at home and felt connected. So the first lesson that I want to leave you is, even though I was torn away at the end of my sophomore year in high school from a place where I developed friends for seven straight years, a place where I was already performing athletically and academically, where I was comfortable going into a place where I had not been in a language that I did not know, in an environment that I had not seen, I wasn't too happy about that initially. In time, I've begun to realize that the lesson in all that is you are being blessed whether you know it or not. And this is the nature of the way blessings come. Things get put into your life. You get put into certain places. You encounter people. And each one of those things is a blessing to you. And you should view it that way. That's the first lesson. The second thing I'll tell you is as I got out here to Jesuit, first I heard about this thing called Justice Under God. Jug. Is there still Jug? Yes. How many of you had Jug? Hey, there's a lot of character out here. That's great. <laughs> you notice that Mike Miller didn't raise his hand in the back. Mike was really good when he was here. I, I used to try to corrupt him as much as I could, but I was not successful. All right, so you know that there is, first, justice is important, but accountability is important. But with justice under God, there's also an expectation of service. You know our motto here, men for others? This is about you being committed to someone else. This is about a spirit of selflessness, a spirit of service to others. Well, I've certainly taken that journey, that, that message set deeply within me at Jesuit. I felt an obligation coming out of Jesuit, and I felt an obligation ever since, and it matched perfectly, as John, I think, will attest, to the values of the U.S. Military Academy that speak of duty and honor and country and reflecting a spirit of service to our nation. And that's where I've been. And so I would tell you the second lesson is a lifetime of service to others is a life worth living. 
you find what it is that lets you demonstrate your service to others. Find it. It's out there. Something's waiting for you. Someone is waiting for you and your compassion, your care, your commitment. They're waiting for you and they need you. And when that time comes, don't shy away from it. You have a community service requirement here that was so important. A high school that demands community service. Tremendous. You're already beginning this idea of being meant for others. Live that lifetime of service. Do your best at serving others. And you'll find it's a very fulfilling life. Should you not take my advice on that and not take the learning that you should have accumulated here at Jesuit, you will miss out. You'll miss out on the best parts of life. So I encourage you to do that as your second lesson. A life of service to others is a life worth living. The last thing I would tell you is, at this stage of your life, you have some ideas, some designs. You know, the great news about Jesuit High School is that you're going to graduate because they prepared you well, and you're probably going to go to college. That's a real high probability, in the 90th percentile. As you go out there to do that, you have many choices ahead of you. Where to go to school, what to study, what to prepare yourself for, what will follow that. In my case, it was always medicine for me. I was going to go into medicine. Pre-med is where I was oriented. Even my community service I did down at Davis, uh, Davis Hospital, uh, where they have the medical school for the University of California, and added to my anatomy and uh, physiology classes that I was taking here at Jesuit, so that I could have first-hand experience before I went into pre-med programs wherever I was accepted. I got accepted to a number of places. We can talk about that in the question and answers if you want to. So medicine was it for me. At some point in time, my focus began to change and the military lifestyle, which I had been pushing against as a rebellious teenager. I didn't want that because it had taken my father away too many times off to Vietnam, which was not very popular back in 1976. But I chose that instead and chose with it a life of leadership. Well, my lesson for you here is you don't know the way before you. You don't know exactly what steps you need to take. You don't know exactly where you're going. But you should know that with every step you take, you are on your way. So you may not know the way, but you're on your way. And you need to keep moving. Keep moving forward with courage. Keep moving forward with commitment. And you'll find exactly what was planned for you. Have faith as you're doing that. Obviously, we teach that here at Jesuit. Faith is an important part. Spirituality is an important part of who you are and what you do. Don't lose sight of that. As you age and mature and have lots and lots of choices, you may choose to drift away from your spiritual foundation. The good news is it's foundation. It's still there. No matter how much you cover it up, it's still there. And if you return to that with frequency and keep it clear, and keep it visible, then you can build anything upon it. So be courageous as you go forward on your journey. As you leave Jacob Lane and head on the lanes of life, know that there are others who are out there who have gone this way before you. You can reach out to us at any time. Jesuit High School does a fantastic job of maintaining communication with its alums. Fantastic. And you'll have plenty of opportunities to continue to give back to Jesuit in ways that you can't necessarily appreciate right now, but they will certainly be there for you in years ahead. So the Chapel of the North American Martyrs is an example of that. Barry Gymnasium is an example of that. And whenever I see that, I, I immediately hearken back to Father Barry. Now, Father Barry is a name for you, but Father Barry is a person bigger than life for me. He was about 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six. he's taller than me, big guy. He was from the classic old Jesuit school. Wore a long cassock every day. Had a dog named Blackie. Had a crew cut. And black horn and glasses. Now the whole order was not like that at the time. 
because the, even the Jesuit order was feeling the same experience that America was feeling in terms of liberalism versus conservatism at the time. What was important, what was not important. And so we had some young priests who were wearing red shirts, blue shirts, t-shirts, and then the older priests who'd been ordained back in the 40s and the 50s, some in the 30s, like Father Barry, who were old school big time. But what was common among all of them was their sense of character. And Father Barry had one of the most extraordinary senses of character of anyone I've ever met in my life. So when you see these names around here, know that uh, there were human beings who were behind them and that there are humans who are living right now who are impacted by them. Just as the staff and faculty now impacts you and you will forever carry them with you as you go into the future. So I appreciate your time and attention. I want to transition to this point into questions and answers so you can ask me anything. And who wants to be first? Please. I'm here to know. How have you let the teachings of Jesuit impact the decisions that you've made throughout your career? Well, I think those uh, foundational things are, are the key. Uh, there are some very practical pieces as well. Let me talk about that for a second. I mentioned the academic program and curriculum here at Jesuit High School. An expectation that you are studying hard and committing yourself. You don't get over it, Jesuit. You do not. You'll be held accountable academically. And that is a very good thing. The challenging curriculum of this college preparatory program, I found prepared me extremely well for West Point. Now, at that time, West Point had a heavy concentration on math and engineering sciences at the, at the, uh, the, the, the root level of all the education that happens there. And that's also what I've been doing at Jesuit, but also the focus at Jesuit on the humanities. Prepared me very, very well. It was almost the same academic structure when I got to the military academy. So, going through the difficulties of Mr. John Ridge's mathematics class to teach algebra 2 and trig prepared me very, very well. He cut me no slack while I was here. And neither did West Point when I got there. So, there's very practical preparation that Jesuit provides you. Then there's the moral ethical foundation that also matched very well to where I chose to go to school. And it will match many of your choices as well. In some cases, it's not going to match, but it's inside of you anyway. And I found that that was something I could draw on all the time. And even now. So as you can imagine, 38 years after walking away from Jesuit High School, I've had lots of life experiences in lots of places. Plenty of challenges, plenty of setbacks, plenty of achievements, plenty of moments of exhilaration, plenty of moments of great fear and trepidation. I've had all that, because I'm an old person, even if my leather jacket still fits. Doesn't it look good though? You got it <laughs> So this is how Jesuit prepared me, and it's, uh, it shows up all the time. It really does. Give me another one, please. In the back, please. Yes, sir. Looking at your leather jacket since you just mentioned it, I noticed your little uh, red J off the right side there, and I'm not sure our fellows in the audience today understand what that little red J is, being that that's an athletic jacket you're wearing. Could you explain it to us? This is our Block J Society, and uh, it reflects people who are taking an extra step beyond engaging community service and leadership and making a difference. So it's the character part of who you are that, uh, that is reflected here, not just the athletic part that's on this side. So this is, uh, this is why I'm honored to wear it. There are lots of things, these, these jackets can tell a story, and uh, just like military uniforms tell a story about what you've done, where you've been, what level you're at at a given point in time. And this is part of my story. My wife, Carol, who's uh, here in the, in the group, I, I met after Jesuit and after West Point. I wish I'd met her before both of those, but uh, I met her after that. She's a military dependent herself, and we were set up by our parents. I call it an arranged military marriage that's worked for 32 years. And uh, it's a, she's a blessing to me in my life for sure. But she tried to convince me many times that you don't need that old jacket anymore. I said, yes, I do, because it's part of who I am. 
It's part of who I am. So this chance to put it on again is a great privilege and to do it here at Jesuit. I remember the day I got this jacket and how proud I was to wear it. I used to wear it all the time. We wore it downtown. We had no problem. Saying when someone asked, who's that? You say, Jesuit. And they all knew what that meant. Everyone knows Jesuit. They know about your excellence. They know about your achievements athletically, national level, state level, regional level. They know about your academic excellence. They know about your character. And we say, Jay High, that's why. Okay? Give me another question, please. Right here in the front and then in the middle on that side. From, uh, from rebelling against the military lifestyle to where you are now at such a high rank, what was the path that led you all the way up? You know, it's, a, it's a great question in terms of the path that led me to where I am right now, especially given an initially rebellious spirit about military service. I think the, uh, that, that spirit of rebellion was one of immaturity. Just to be honest with you, I, I didn't completely understand why things were the way they were. I didn't understand why it was that my father was being called away to Vietnam on two occasions. I didn't understand why society didn't appreciate that, didn't value that, or didn't sense the pain that I was in when he was gone. And so I was angry. In time, I began to realize that he wasn't doing it for the nation's accolades. He was doing it out of a spirit of service. An additional catalyst for me that caused me to move away from a pure focus on medicine to military medicine to then military, and it, that really is how it shifted. It was, it was medicine, then, well, maybe military medicine. Then it was, no, it's the military experience that I want, and then fundamentally, I want to be a leader. And that's why I chose West Point, because I knew what it produced. It had a reputation also, just like Jesuit. So that put me on a slightly different journey at that point in time. It was a conscious decision, being honest with myself in a moment of reflection about really what was important to me, and rejecting the things that I had allowed to creep in that had caused me to be angry that weren't under my control anyway, and beginning to understand better what was really before me, as I was seeing the experience, as I was going through the experience, that moved me in a different direction. Since then, I found that it was the right calling for me. I responded to something that I believe is spiritual for me. This is where I'm supposed to be right now. I'm not finished yet in my service, militarily. I don't think I'm finished in my service to humanity either. So I can't stay in the military forever. In fact, Carol keeps asking me, so uh, when, is, when is the end of this? Because it's been a long time. Uh, lots of years apart. Lots of time in uh, dangerous places, but trying to make a difference in the lives of others. Uh, there's still more service ahead for me. If there's life ahead for me. Remember I said a lifetime of service to others is a life worth living. And until you have no life left, you should be serving others. So I know I'm not finished the sense of making a difference in the lives of others continues to build in me and gives me the appeal and the energy to keep going, to keep going, another step, uh, to keep accepting the blessings that I didn't know were there. So this is really what it's been for me. Search yourselves. Don't be afraid of what you see. Come to grips with it. And then open yourself to the calling that's awaiting you. And then go. Don't look back. Go for it. And if you find that a door is closed, you know how it is. One door closes and the windows of heaven are opening up somewhere else. There's something else for you. If it were not so, you would not have life and breath. So even when you find an obstacle or even a closed, locked door where it's the end of a particular path you're on, don't be discouraged. There's something else waiting for you or you wouldn't have life. That's how I see it. I, mean, I fundamentally believe that. There was a question in the middle. Yes, please. General Brooks, sir, when did you know that you wanted to go to West Point? Later than I should have. So the question was, when did I know that I wanted to go to West Point? Uh, when my brother came home after his first six months there. Now, he was a, a solid student, a strong student leader also. 
He was a, a, a bit of an icon here. So how many footballers do we have in here? All right. You ever hear of the Iron Man Award? Okay, you're going to see Leo Brooks on there in, in 75. So my brother was a tough guy too. So he was physically strong. He's shorter than me. Not nearly as good looking as I am. If you ever see him, make sure John you remind him of that. Uh, but uh, was certainly a, uh, an important image for me. Even though we were only 14 months apart, I always looked up to my big brother, even though he's shorter than me. He went to West Point, and he came back with even more character than he had when he left. And that appealed to me. I said, wow, there's something here that I think matches me. And so I'm in my senior year, and I applied. Now, the good news is I've been paying attention to what Jesuit told me, so my academics were nice and solid. I've been involved in athletic leadership and community leadership and other things. The community service activities of Jesuit have filled me in terms of being a well-rounded candidate for the U.S. Military Academy. And a good word from my brother to the coach of the basketball team, Mike Krzyzewski, says, I've got a brother who plays basketball. He's pretty good. He'd like to come to West Point. That was a pretty courageous thing for my freshman brother at U.S. Military Academy to say to the head coach of the basketball team, but he did. And Coach K called me at home in Sacramento and said, send me some tapes, some films, as it was. And nowadays you say, well, I'll just, my, my best game is posted on, on YouTube, so everyone has seen it out there, so I'll just give you the link. Nowadays, it's different. Then we had films. And so I talked to Coach Lynn Stevens, who was the head coach of the basketball team at the time, and his assistant coach, John Dilley, and said, uh, Coach K has asked me to send him some footage of a game. So we sent it, and then the recruitment began. And he was able to accelerate the process of admission for a recruited athlete who also met the requirements. And then I got the appointment. I was telling uh, some of your, your, your Jesuit brethren last night at dinner that kind of in typical government style, I was all mentally prepared to go off to West Point. And I get this letter from the United States Military Academy at West Point. I'm excited. Here it is. I open the letter up and it says, we are sorry to inform you. Anytime a letter begins with that, it's probably not going to be good. We're sorry to inform you that you were not accepted for admission into the West Point class of 1980 in the summer of 1976. Heartbroken. And I had other options, so that wasn't the only thing I was pursuing. But that's what I wanted to do at that point in time. The next day, I get a different letter. Congratulations. You have been accepted for admission into the United States Military Academy class of 1980 in the summer of 1976. The very next day. Don't be discouraged. If you're answering your calling, the door will open. And so then I absolutely knew that that's where I should go. Now, once you get there, you've got to meet the challenges, just like being here. You don't get to just stay at Jesuit because you're at Jesuit. It's not just about the tuition. You must perform or you won't be here. The same is the case at the U.S. Military Academy. And so while that was fun and adventurous and challenging and hard and difficult and rewarding and all the above, it wasn't guaranteed. So what I carried from here and that determination and that clear message that that's where I belonged allowed me to then pursue excellence at West Point. I got to share a story with you here. And I think I saw a hand on this side. Was there another one? I'll, I'll come to you and just say, okay, that's where we're going to go next. One of the toughest decisions I've had to make in life was to stop playing basketball. Now on the surface you go, it's a big deal. You either play or you don't play. No. Because of the way the door had opened for me, I felt an obligation to continue playing. But frankly, when you get to the military academy, almost everyone in the entire Corps of Cadets was in the top part of their academic class. They were all class presidents. They're all National Honor Society members. They'd all been team captains, sometimes of multiple teams, multiple sports. And so to be distinguished among that group is to be extraordinarily distinguished. And frankly, someone is going to be last. And if someone who is excellent 
up to that point in time. I wasn't doing as well academically as I'd been accustomed to doing. I was doing well, but not well enough. It was very clear to me that I was not personally able to balance anymore the academic load of West Point, the military load of West Point, and the athletic load that was happening as a varsity athlete as a freshman. I couldn't balance it. And so at the end of that season, that first season, I had to go see Coach K and look him in the eye personally. After much internal deliberation and much internal angst, and say to him, Coach, I don't think I can come back on a team next year. I need to concentrate on academics. I knew I wasn't going to be a professional basketball player, but I certainly intended to be a professional Army officer and a graduate of West Point. And I had to make a choice. It's unfortunate that I was not able to balance both. Because on that team, we had no seniors. I, mean, I probably would have been the captain of the team for two or three years. But that was not what was called for for me. And so he said, and I owe oh, great credit, I just saw him about a month and a half ago. I say this whenever I see him and whenever I talk to anyone in public about Coach K. He could have castigated me at that moment. He could have said, you ungrateful fool, how could you do this? After we committed ourselves to you and got you into the academy on an accelerated basis with an expectation that you'd give back and you're not, you're not going to come back on the team, how can you do that? That's not what Coach K said. He said, I'll support you. This is what leadership is about. Supporting someone else. And believe me when I tell you that, that caused me to redouble my efforts then. On the very next semester, I was on the dean's list academically. And ultimately rose to the top military order of merit position. So the top ranking position out of 4,000 cadets. And essentially the, the senior cadet responsible for all of the other classes at West Point in the same class that brought women in for the first time at the military academy. So I received abundant blessings because of that decision, but also because of Coach K and his leadership, his devotion to me. That was my journey. So that's kind of how I got started on where I am now. So please, welcome back. What's the most dangerous situation you've been in the Army? Most dangerous situation I've been in the Army? Uh, getting Carol mad at me. <laughs> that has clearly been the most hazardous. That, that's, that's worse than having rockets coming on me in Baghdad. Uh, I've been in interesting places, and like any warrior of 30 plus years, uh, I've been exposed to danger a number of times, and I'm still here, and I give thanks to God for that. Uh, you know, there are many things that come to mind. Many of you have heard about the surge in Iraq. It happened in the summer of 2006, really the, the, the winter of 2006, through about the middle of 2008, and how Baghdad was under great, great difficulty, like it is now. And being there uh, in the, <clears throat> the central unit, right there in Baghdad for 15 months, not knowing whether you're winning or not. It's one thing about life, it's also one thing about warfare. When you're in the middle of it, you don't know if you're winning or not. Kind of like being in a, a great basketball game and tournament of champions. When you're in it, you don't know if you're winning or not. And just because the scoreboard says something does not mean that's the way it's going to end. And so plenty of danger and hazard and the necessity as a leader, I was a brigadier general at that time, the necessity to share hardship and danger with my soldiers. So they might be out in a given area trying to cause prosperity to get moving again, trying to help build governance where there was none, trying to eliminate people who are trying to kill lots of people and beheading them on the street, leaving their bodies in schoolyards, loading little girls in the backs of trucks while they bled out onto the street and letting no one do anything for them. This is what was happening around our soldiers. You've got to be out there with them when that happens. And obviously that provides plenty of opportunities to be exposed to rocket attack, to machine gun attacks, to uh, ambushes, to explosives underneath the vehicles, to personal assassinations, to lots of things. All that's been out there. Uh, more live than die in warfare. Those who live owe a debt of gratitude to those who die. That's why the Chapel of the North American Martyrs makes a difference and why its name is so important. Those who live have an obligation to those who die in some form or another. 
to either do your very best in everything you do, to not take life for granted, not one second. All these things are part of the, the duty that we owe to those who did not come back with us. And they're more than I care to number. They didn't come back with us. So plenty of dangers to that. There have been other places as well. But, uh, you know, it's dangerous doing reckless and foolish things as a high school student in Jesuit. And not everybody made it there either. And you may have lost someone from the class of 2015 along the way. Sometimes it's because of their health. Sometimes it's because of judgment decisions. Sometimes you might have been with them and engaged in a bad judgment also. And you may have the feelings of guilt about why you lived and they didn't. Or that it was your fault. Or that you should have done something about it. And all those things are life's burdens and lessons. They are part of the hazard as well. Part of the, part of the danger. Okay, give me another one. All right, please over on this side and then in the, in the second row, the third row, fourth row. Yeah, so this, this question is about the international environment right now. Trust me, I, I get to touch the international environment quite a bit. The region that I currently have responsibility within is about half of the world. And uh, inside of it is more than half the world's population. More than 80% of the natural disasters that result in loss of human life. But it's not where those places are you described. So Ukraine, Iraq, Syria, the Islamic State, uh, these kinds of issues. Uh, it's hard to say where those are going to go. It, it's, it's tragic. And certainly as a veteran of combat with three and a half years in Iraq, Three and a half years. I don't like the direction it's going. But I also could see that direction in 2010. It's fundamentally, when people make selfish decisions, as many members of the government did in Iraq after they had an incredible opportunity to move their country forward and exceed everyone else in the Middle East, and they had that opportunity, whether it was through free and fair elections or reactivation of the economy, all those things that we helped them put into place. And we helped we help them. We didn't do it for them. They did that. But their political leadership fell back on ancient Babylonian behaviors of selfishness. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar had the same problem in the same place. Selfishness. And he destroyed Babylon because of his selfishness. Unfortunately, he has been succeeded by others with the same motivation. And they have destroyed the new Babylon, Iraq, and opened the door to this violence and chaos that's now putting the region into a tailspin. I don't know which way it's going to go. I do know that only the countries in the region are going to be able to solve the problem. And until they make different decisions, any amount of support and assistance will be short-lived, just as it was in this case. At the same time, I hold out encouragement Humans, I do believe, will make the right choices over time. It's sad that life is lost in the meantime. It's tragic. That's not what God calls us for. But that's what happens anyway. In time, I'm confident they'll make the right choices in the region. It's going to stabilize itself. And it means that there has to be commitment in the meantime. Ukraine, not sure which way that's going to go. I mean, that's, a, that's not working out very well for Russia. It's not. It may, in terms of expressing a sense of muscularity but the economic impacts of that are devastating to Russia that's not good Russia 25 years from now is going to be in serious trouble because of what they're doing right now and that's not good for the world so there'll be more work ahead for us as Americans who can't stand back and watch these things because we live in this world and we are in a position where the world expects leadership from us there are things that we bring to bear. We are an emblem for much of the world. They may not like our policies, and, and not all Americans like our policies either. We're going to have a healthy debate on our policies. They like that. They don't like the chaos that comes from the healthy debate. They like to see that control. They like the choices that you're able to make. They want to be part of that. They like the fact that every Jesuit student has an iPad. And that they might even be able to talk to you online. 
and they can become a part of you. America has a place in the world, even in a very dangerous world, and we can't be afraid of that. There was someone in this, this second row, please. What's the biggest challenge you're currently facing as a, as a general? Yes, the biggest challenge I'm facing as an Army general. I've been putting my other jacket on here. You guys aren't asking me about Jay High, that's why. I haven't started any triple J's in here. Uh, biggest challenge right now is how to demonstrate to our regional friends, there are 36 countries in the region that, uh, that I, I described to you, demonstrate to them that we remain committed while acknowledging the budgetary fiscal pressures that exist in the United States and in other capitals of the world. We can't afford to be everywhere all the time, we cannot, nor do we choose to. Reconciling those two in a world that's dangerous and still calling for our presence and our leadership. Reconciling that. So that requires complex planning. It requires strategic thinking. It also requires critical thinking. Many of you know how to do that. The Jesuits are great about stimulating critical thinkers. Everything's not as it should be. And you ought to be questioning, why is it like this? Why isn't it better? Why can't it be better? Why is there no justice? Why did this happen? Why is someone economically deprived in my country? This critical thinking is part of you. It's part of what we have to do also. So balancing those two opposite forces, increased presence, demonstrating our commitment where it's needed, reduced resources in a time where the nation is somewhat fatigued about our international engagements. The consequences, though, of being internationally disengaged, in my opinion, and certainly in some evidence of history, the consequence of being disengaged is far more costly than the consequence of being engaged. I, I fundamentally believe this. A couple rows back behind you, there's one, and then there's three in the back. And then um, we'll come back to this side. Um, are there any regrets that you had coming out of Jesuit? And also, is there anything that you uh, were thankful for taking advantage of? I, I think I regret that I didn't get back to Jesuit sooner than 38 years. <laughs> That's just the way my career has been. I've been oriented in a very different direction. I didn't have a military reason to be on the West Coast. I do now because of the Pacific states and my responsibilities for Army activities in the Pacific. So I was in Washington State yesterday here in Sacramento. I met with the State uh, National Guard with whom we do some work in the region. Going down to Monterey to talk to the Naval Postgraduate School. Going to Stanford to talk to them a little bit. And then uh, continue on a, a journey that's on the West Coast. So I, if you're looking for a deep emotional regret, I, I tend not to hang on to regrets like that. And so I'm having a hard time coming up with them. And there are things that I wish I had taken advantage of. Uh, you, know, you run out of time on lots of things. You're running out of time right now in the class of 2015. You may not realize it. Folks, you're on a well-lubricated skateboard is heading out the door. It's coming quickly. And it'll be here faster than you think. And you'll put on your Marauder colors for the last time as a Jesuit student. And then it will hit you. So there's a great picture. Mike Miller remember these folks, but it's a picture right at the end of graduation. I'm standing there right down, right down the, the alleyway here with two of my droogies as we call them. There was a book called Clockwork Orange that was out at that point in time. They are both taller than me, both better basketball players, but Bill Brady and Garth Davey, dear friends, fellow basketball players. And when it occurs that you might be seeing them for the last time, you can't help but be filled with, did I take advantage of all the time I had with them? Now the good news is if you have life, you can still communicate with them. And nowadays it's easier than ever. So if there's anything, I, I kind of regret that I didn't have enough contact. I wish I had more. But I'm thankful for that which I did have. Very thankful that I came here. If I had gone to Sac High, I would have been in a different place. I'm convinced of it. Might I have gotten into West Point? Perhaps. Would I have been as well prepared? No. I'm not trying to bash Sacramento High School. I don't know what its condition is right now. But it didn't match the experience that I had coming in. 
I am so grateful that the door is open for me to come to judgment. And so that's uh, that's kind of how I look at it. No significant regrets. Let me go on the back, and I, I, I think I can take two more because I'm feeling a, a hook, and you guys are going to back to class. Uh, let me go to the red red sleeves and black jacket, please. My most fond memory of Jesuit. Um, wow, loaded. There are so many. And even if, whenever I think the word Jesuit, I just get flooded with the experience here. It's the friends that I had. That's absolutely it. We did everything together. Everything. Good raids on Loretto High School that we shouldn't have done. Tell you, and ask your buddies who were with me at dinner last night about that. So I got caught and I did jug. But everything we did together. We grew up together. We learned about life and love together. Some of that was love for one another. We were men for others then with one another in our class, on our teams. Getting to know Mike Miller, seeing his brother Bob go off the Citadel, you know, seeing the inspiration from that. That's the fondest part of the experience. And I can think of any number of things. I, I can think about the cinder track down there we're still trying to replace, that good old cinder track. Doesn't prevent you from having champions. But it's time to update it. It's, it's time. So thank you, Father Sawalski, for pursuing that. Uh, winning the Tournament of Champions. Being down there and seeing Bill Cartwright at Elk Grove ultimately went off to the pros. First pro that came out of the region at the time. Watching him play. We didn't go head to head with them. We ended up, I guess, third like, that year. So we didn't meet them in the finals. Got knocked out in the semifinals for state. Feeling old when Bill Cartwright retired from the NBA. <laughs> Hanging out with guys like Matt Booza, who was a quarterback of our football team then, went on as a walk-on to play for the Baltimore Colts and others, played eight years in the NFL, and knowing that I was with guys like that. Running track with Bill Bucky, maintaining contact with him now as he became a Marine Corps aviator, and just retired recently as a Marine Corps colonel, maintaining contact with him through the years, and longing for that contact. That's what I'm filled with when I think about fondest experiences of Jesuit, and they're part of the fond experiences that have happened ever since. Anytime that I'm with soldiers who are accomplishing things and I can see an impact on their lives, that's deeply rewarding for me. And I've been blessed to have that happen again and again and again and again over the years, especially having so many soldiers under my care. Well, I, I wish I could stay with you longer, and I hope that my words will stick with you longer than my physical presence will. I do hope that you can see yourself a little bit in me as I was once in your seat and I knew that I was blessed to be in your seat I do want to leave that with you as I part your company and know that I'm part of that same line of 8,000 or so who graduated from this great institution and you're going to soon be a part of it as well you are a part of now, you're Jesuit, you are Jesuit, the rest of us are alumni of Jesuits but you are the lifeblood of this high school this institution, this icon. I wish you well. I wish you God's blessings on everything you do. Everything. Every mistake you make. Every achievement you make. Be blessed in all of it. And we look forward to seeing you out there and maintaining contact with you as we continue to build a better world with the tools that we were given while here. So thanks to each of you. We look forward to seeing you again. Thanks again for your time. Thanks. thanks. General still had his letter jacket, so we got him a couple more things to wear uh, to travel around with him. And I see, General, those stars on your letter jacket seem to forsake the future. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, General Brooks. You all have a couple minutes. Uh, next class begins at 11.05. Don't be late, you'll get jumped.